In the decades before the First World War, there was significant migration from the British Isles. Millions left to build new lives overseas. From the middle of the 19th century onwards, people were leaving the UK in large numbers. This was the age of mass migration. Approximately 13 million people left these islands between 1850 and 1914. Up until about 1900, migration was mostly to America. And then after 1900, it, there's a shift towards the, the dominions within the British Empire, especially Canada. British migrants travelled all across the globe. However, many settled in the English-speaking British dominions, Canada, Australia and New Zealand. We're looking at places that were part of the British Empire. They were English-speaking. Culturally, they were in many ways very similar to the United Kingdom. So that was a major attraction. In the age of mass migration, movements were affected by a number of pull and push factors. In the Northeast specifically, of course, towards the end of the 19th century, we see a decline in some of the traditional industries. You know, we're beginning to see shifts in how people work. In terms of why people left the Northeast, it's primarily economic. These people are economic migrants. But there's also a belief that within the Dominions, it is a better Britain, that they can have better lives than they can do uh, at home. Journeys were becoming cheaper in the 20th century and people were able to move around the globe a lot more easily. Many of these people would have taken the traditional migration route out through Liverpool on the ships which would travel out to Canada, Australia and New Zealand with specific intention to carry migrants out to the Dominions. At the outbreak of war, thousands of men from the northeast of England living overseas joined up with the Dominion armies to fight for Britain and its empire. The lives of three of these men are particularly fascinating. George Burden McKean was born in Willington in County Durham in 1888. A cabinet maker by trade, McKean travelled to Alberta in northwest Canada in 1909, where his brother was already working as a rancher. McKean arrives in Alberta in 1909 and the years before the First World War are relatively well documented. He became a theological student at the Presbyterian Robinson Church and then he signed up for a course at the University of Alberta. Before leaving the Northeast, McKean had been an apprentice cabinet maker. Uh, by 1914 he was training to be a teacher and training to be a Presbyterian minister, so his, his life had considerably improved. John Collinson was another man from the North East, who emigrated first to South Africa and then to Australia in search of a better life. Well, perhaps one of the most remarkable stories is John Collinson, who was born in a mining community of Shiremoor, but moved with his family to Wall's End shortly at the age of about five. Well, we know he attended basic schooling in Wall's End and went to work in the shipyards where he trained as a boiler maker, essentially a metal worker in the shipyards. But by 1914, he's emigrated to South Africa, moving on to Australia by 1915. For John George Huntley Wood, travelling to New Zealand was not just a new start, but also the culmination of a social and professional journey. John George Huntley Wood is a remarkable example of someone who had a life which would be probably impossible to have today. The son of a sea captain who was born in Blythe but was educated in a small private school in North Shields on the banks of the Tyne. 
he followed his father into the merchant service and through a series of um, years achieved the necessary certificates to make him a master of a merchant vessel. However, he returns to Tyneside and enrolls at the Newcastle School of Medicine, now part of the University of Newcastle. Following his medical training, Wood returns to sea and then takes up an appointment in the town of St Andrews near to Timaru in the South Island of New Zealand. For these three men of the North East, leaving Britain offered new experiences and opportunities overseas. But in the months and years that followed, each of their lives would take unexpected turns. On August the 4th, 1914, Britain declared war on Germany. At the same time, Canada, Australia and New Zealand joined the war. As part of the empire, the British dominions were determined to make a contribution to the war effort. For the dominions, the initial period, August, September, as in Britain, saw intense interest in the outbreak of war and saw young men uh, rushing to the colours uh, and seeking to, to join up. The outbreak of war tended to manifest, or re-manifest rather, the Britishness of many of these migrants. That's essentially, of course, where they came from. That was their home. And it was their home that was very threatened by this war. So many were reaffirming their Britishness at this time. For McKean, Collinson and Huntley Wood, the outbreak of war would transform each of their lives in very different ways. McKean was living in Edmonton, Alberta at the outbreak of war in August 1914. We know that he tried at least three times to join up with the Canadian Expeditionary Force, but kept on getting refused, largely because it seems he was so short, he was uh, five feet six inches. He's eventually successful in January 1915. The first contingent of the Canadian Expeditionary Force that goes out to Europe at the beginning of the First World War, approximately 70% of the men were British born. In that sense, McKean's eagerness to join up in 1914 was typical of many of those like him who had been originally born in Britain. On the night of the 27th and 28th of April 1918, uh, McKean was leading a small group uh, in a trench raid when it encountered heavy German opposition. McKean climbed out of the trench, the German trench, uh, bypassed the German opposition, uh, dived headfirst into the trench, landing on a, a German en enemy. He was then attacked by another German and he killed both of them before his men caught up with him and then they took out the remaining Germans. McKean arrived in France in the summer of 1916. Uh, in early 1917, he was awarded the, the Military Medal for Valorous Conduct. And the following year, in April 1918, he was awarded the Victoria Cross. As a result of wounds sustained in battle, McKean returned to Britain in September 1918. It was there that he would see out the end of the war. McKean died in a tragic industrial accident whilst operating a sawmill in 1926. Though McKean never returned to Canada, he was remembered in his adopted country for his bravery and heroism. In 1951, Mount McKean was named after him as part of the Victoria Cross range of mountains. <laughs>
Whilst John Collinson did not have such a highly decorated military career as McKean, his war service nonetheless changed his life in ways that he could never have expected. We know that Collinson enlists in the Australian Imperial Force in 1915, and via the Dardanelles, he ends up in France in 1916. He takes part in fighting on the Somme in October 1916, where he's badly wounded. Collinson is wounded in the forearms by shrapnel and is brought to Britain for hospital treatment, and he undergoes a long series of operations through to November of 1917. On one occasion, whilst under chloroform, he begins to sing. This is remarked upon by some of the theatre staff, what a nice voice, a lovely voice this man has, and uh, subsequently, by some happen chance, he's introduced to Sir Henry Wood the founder of the Proms Concerts, who arranges some training for him, voice training at the Royal Academy of Music. And subsequent to that, he embarks on a career in the entertainment world in London in the early 1920s, including working as an operatic tenor for the British Broadcasting Corporation, which subsequently becomes the BBC as we know it today. It's a remarkable story of how someone is discovered. His life changes fundamentally to becoming an opera singer who's touring Europe, who's performing on the radio, uh, and who has this remarkable career. Collinson's very, very great example of how, although nothing much good ever seems to come of wars, in his case, it changes life remarkably. With his basic training, he would never have come in contact with such luminaries as Sir Henry Wood and would never have had the successful career as an operatic tenor. Um, it's hard to imagine a, ch a change of life more dramatic than a shipbuilder to an operatic tenor, all brought about by the war. In 1940, Collinson returned to Australia and died there in 1973. Today, he is still remembered for being the first artist to record Australia's unofficial national anthem, Waltzing Matilda, in 1926. <laughs> While Collinson survived the war, the conflict would have tragic consequences for John George Huntley Wood. Wood settled in a relatively small community. He knew his patients. He was respected clearly. He enlists in the New Zealand Army Medical Services. He goes as a draft to Egypt and he becomes the regimental medical officer of the Wellington Mounted Rifles. We know that he was right up at the front line because there are reports from men who are with him in the papers we have indicating that he would be wont to ride right out into the firing line, dismount, attend to wounded men, throwing them across the pommel of the horse on occasions and riding back to his own line. So he was in considerable danger and of course ultimately he was wounded which led to his death following evacuation first to Katia and then back to Cairo where he dies in the war hospital and is buried in a British war cemetery in Cairo. Wood's an interesting example in that in his community that he was adopted by, uh, he's remembered uh, on their war memorial uh, from the First World War, but he's also remembered back here uh, you know, through his training at the RVI and through his family's headstone in North Shields. Wood had only settled in New Zealand shortly before the war, yet his loss was very deeply felt by the community he had been such a vital part of. Wood's wife and young children left New Zealand after his death and returned to Britain. War would continue to affect the family, as Wood's son was killed in action in 1943 while serving with the RAF. <laughs> 
thousands of men from the Northeast, who had left their homeland and former lives behind, were still willing to return, fight, and in some cases even die for Britain and its empire during the First World War. Despite leaving Britain behind, these men still had a strong sense of Britishness. Understanding the migration stories of our three men is critical in helping us understand the wider legacy of the war, not just in Britain, but for what really was a global community of Britons at the time. Well, it's quite clear that a remarkable number of people had left the region and had it not been for the war, their stories would probably have been lost because they dissipated across vast territories and vast areas of the globe. But the war was the thing which brought them back. When we think about the First World War and those who served, often we think about it in terms of the British Army. What the Dominion Geordies help us to understand is that people from these islands and from the northeast served in the armies of countries that are thousands of miles away. But we can't understand the First World War if we don't understand these transnational elements. In their own ways, Collinson, Wood and McKean can be seen as Australian or Canadian or New Zealand soldiers, but we, we need to be aware that their origins in the North East were part of who they were. They were Geordies, they were North Easterners, they were English, they were British, as well as being Australian, New Zealand or Canadian.